Okay, so this lecture is going to be called Reformers, Reactionaries, and Revolutionaries, the three R's for Russia. And we haven't talked about Russia in a while. This is a 100 year span from 1814 to 1914 looking at Russia history. Uh, so we're going to start, uh, and ultimately you're going to see that this kind of plays out the way that English politics played out in the 1600s with the James the first and then a Charles the first and then a Cromwell and then a Charles the second and a James the second and a revolution. The Russians would have plenty of revolutions. Uh, we're going to get started on that a little bit. Um, and we're going to see that Russia, instead of James's and Charles's, they have Alexander's and Nicholas's. Um, so we're going to start with Alexander the first. And of the three R's, he would be characterized as a reformer. And the reason why he would be considered a reformer is because he was czar at the time that Napoleon and Napoleon's forces interacted with the Russians. All right? And clearly Russia got to see, relative to the French and the French armies and French liberties, etc., etc., how far ahead uh, the French generally were. That's kind of a, I call it like a pants drop. All right? That's sort of where Russia gets exposed for being a backward autocratic country and recognizing that the countries that they interact with are a lot more advanced and a lot more progressive. So naturally from that experience, Alexander, even though he's fearful of like full out revolution, he does recognize that Russia probably needs to change. So it mentions that um, his chief minister's name is Michael Speransky and that like Catherine the Great before the Pugachev Rebellion, that there was an expectation that Russia would start integrating or at least introducing some semblance of reforms. So it would be a reform from above kind of situation rather than a revolution type of situation. But that reform was necessary if Russia was going to be able to make it into the 19th century. So. Uh, among the discussions that Michael Speransky and Alexander had were a, a gradual elimination of serfdom. Russia was still a country that had serfdom uh, well into the 19th century, and then also a representative assembly. All right, there's still an absolute monarchy, a czarist autocracy, and the fact is that even Alexander recognized that the Russian people also interacted with the French. Uh, during the Napoleonic Wars, and there's no way that they weren't infected by that. Okay. Next thing that it mentions in the notes is, is sources of discontent. And this is a recognition in Russian society, and this is not new. I mean, for God's sakes, every one of those um, uprisings that we saw um, from the um, Cossacks, 1609, 1617, 1785, with some type of recognition that things in Russian society needed to be improved. Okay, So there's two different groups, and this is kind of like the, the beginnings of some political awareness that Russia needed desperately to make some reforms. The first is called the Southern Society. All right, And this is a much more radical group. Uh, you would almost liken them kind of like to the Jacobins if we were looking at a difference between Jacobins and Girondists. The Southern Society and the Northern Society would be the Jacobins and the Girodis. Uh, the, the Southern Society would have recognized themselves mostly the way that the Jacobins did. Their leader was an army figure by the name of Pestel, and he was advocating for the elimination of serfdom and a representative assembly, and that he advocated a democratic republic rather than a constitutional monarchy. So he wanted an elimination of Tsar. Uh, czarism or czarist uh, monarchy and they also advocated for the independence of the Polish people. Remember Poland was eliminated from the map and he was uh, recognizing that that Russia served as a foreign occupier uh, of a people that deserved to be free. So there's a nationalism awareness there uh, and there's also a, a radical liberalism awareness there uh, where they wanted to advance Russia from absolute czarist autocracy to a liberal democratic republic. Well, obviously that's not going to happen, uh, but there at least you understand that there is a group of intellectuals and among the military, because the military would have had first contact with France, uh, that wanted those type of changes. 
the more conservative group was called the Northern Society. And the Northern Society advocated the elimination of serfdom, but pushed for a constitutional monarchy. And they didn't really say anything about the Poles, and they also wanted to make sure that landowners had their interests protected. So these are the type of folks that the Boyer nobility uh, might have identified for. They, they, they saw a glorious revolution type of completion to the Russian Revolution if there was going to be any kind of reforms that would have occurred. Okay, Eventually Alexander uh, is, is going to be out and the person that takes over for Alexander is either going to be Constantine or Nicholas. This is a couple of brothers and Russia has kind of messy uh, succession problems. They don't like appoint a successor per se, which is why we ran into those problems with Peter the Great, if you remember that. Well, it's the same thing. But just to show you how jacked up Russia is, Constantine and Nicholas were the next up, and neither one of them wanted to be czar. So they're kind of like, you do it. No, 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 really, you do it. And while they're trying to figure out who's going to be the next czar, there was an uprising among army um, and other liberals called the Decembrist Revolt. And this uh, was pushing for liberal constitutional. It's the kind of stuff that the Southern Society and the Northern Society were contemplating, um, but it was a kind of a violent uprising. You know, So once again, if you guys remember the Lysol on crap analogy, Russia has a point where even their leadership recognized reform, that the Decembrist Revolt was an act that was associated with the need for reform, but they never saw it that way. They saw it as, it smells in here, spray the Lysol. And it sets them back another 25 years, because they're pathing along the way, that, like even when Catherine the Great was pathing towards enlightened reforms, and then Pugachev happened, and then she got like crazy you know, Russian. And then the same thing is going to happen here. In order to establish order, Nicholas decides among the brothers that he will become the next czar, and rather than continuing a path towards reform, he goes Lysol on crap and starts a period of reactionary policy. And this is something that Russia will consistently do. Some people would even say that Putin was the reaction to Yeltsin's reforms. So under Nicholas, who rules from 1825 to 1855, there's a whole period of policies that are designed to kind of reinstitute discipline and the Russian way of doing things. And so they adopted a secret police force. That's not anything new, uh, but they're starting to modernize and it is starting to become a permanent fixture uh, in Russian society. Then they employed a minister of education. Okay. His name was Sergei Uvarov, and his job uh, was to impose this program called official nationality on the Russian people. And the catchphrase for it was autocracy, orthodoxy, nationalism. That those were like the, that's their slogan. That's what Russian people stand for. Autocratic government in the form of the czar, orthodoxy, meaning orthodox Christianity, and nationalism, that they are Russian interest first. Okay? While um, the 1830 revolutions were happening in France and Bil Belgium was pushing for its independence, remember that Poland had an uprising that was pushing for its independence, and the, Brus the Russians brutally suppressed it. Okay? Official dissidents, these are people that were speaking out against Russian autocracy, were jailed en masse, meaning 150,000 Russian people uh, that were moved and relocated to Siberia, as if that was something new. They've been doing that since Ivan III. There was a period of censorship where they were watching what was being published. They were watching assembly. Remember, they don't have any of those things. They don't have freedom of speech and freedom of religion and freedom of assembly and all of those things. Okay, This is Russia, right? and that stuff does not happen. But when you spray the crap, like I mentioned, and say, it stinks in here, okay, it doesn't get rid of anything except the stink. And the source of the stink is the thing that is ultimately going to fester. So, when we look at a period of reform and reaction, all the while, the revolutionary voices are getting more intense in Russia. 
And so I'm going to give you a few names here. The first is, it's part of a group that they call the Russian intelligentsia. And they've been around for a while. Under Catherine the Great, it started with a guy by the name of Alexander Radishev, R-A-D-I-S-C-H-E-V, who wrote a book called Journey from St. Petersburg to Moscow. Very, very critical of the way uh, that Russian people survived under an autocratic uh, regime. Looked at the, ra- or the, 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 the heights of illiteracy, the drunkenness, the, just the vice, uh, the, like a very desperate kind of place. All right. Um, then here's a couple of forerunners to more, I guess, functional um, movements. The first is his name is Alexander Herzen, all right, an early revolutionary uh, in Russia um, who prefigures populism. One of the things that he was arguing for was that the Russian serfs or the Russian peasants would be able to seize their land. All right, and develop it into almost like an, an agriculturally based socialist society where land ownership would be, which would be shared uh, among all of the Russian people. And of course he's writing in Britain because if he was writing this stuff vocally, uh, if he was out there in Russia, then they would have jailed him and threw him into Siberia. So he has a platform, but that platform uh, is in the underground. His work was called The Colocal, which means The Bell. It was an underground newspaper, but he's out there, and he's starting to find an audience among other Russian intellectuals who were starting to think about the same things. Russia was desperate for land reform in a time when Russia had a very intense version of serfdom. The other figure, and this is going to, for I guess, be a forerunner to the more radical-oriented groups that will pop up in the late 19th century in Russia is a guy named Mikhail Bakunin. Okay? And he is one of the leading European anarchists in the 19th century. And remember the anarchists, uh, they look at the system of governance in Russia, not say that it's unique to Russia or whatever, but that the system was so broke that any form of governance, governance would be some type of oppression. And it's not illogical that Bakunin would feel that way because that's what Russia was. Okay, their system of governance was so oppressive and so uh, backward that they didn't believe that it could ever be repaired. And the only thing that could really happen is revolutionary violence would ultimately take it out. Okay, so when you get to more radical, terroristic, anarchistic type of groups, uh, the the father of those type of movements in Russia would be Mikhail Bakunin. All right, so what we're saying here is that there is a handful of revolutionaries that are speaking out, developing underground newspapers, developing an underground following, and their voices are only going to get ratcheted up. That's that source of the stink, okay? That's starting to pile up on the surface, underneath, okay? But eventually it's going to hit hit a point uh, where it cannot be stopped. And that's why when it comes, it's going to come hard, and that's in the the November Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, Uh, the revolutions that follow in 1917, okay? Because Lysol on crap constantly throughout Russian history, uh, that's what's taking place, okay? Here's another exposure moment, okay? If the first exposure moment was the Napoleonic invasions that show how backward Russia really is, then in the middle of the 19th century, they get another one, all right? And that comes in the form of the Crimean War. And we've been talking about in class how the primary objective of Russia in terms of their foreign policy is to get access to warm water ports. Okay? And that Britain in particular, but also France, are doing everything in their power uh, to remove that influence. That the control of the Eastern Mediterranean, the control of those, those trade routes, the naval control, uh, that belongs to those Western European powers and they do not want Russia meddling in their spheres of influence. Okay. So the way that this ultimately goes down, and like I said, it, 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 there's a long kind of march towards this. It started in 1774 when Russia had fought a successful war against the Turks under Catherine the Great and got a peace treaty where the Russians got the right to protect Orthodox Christians in the Holy Land. And like I said, if not for the Napoleonic Wars, uh, there probably would have been some kind of... Uh, clash between the British and the Russians 
if not for Napoleon, over this issue, over the fact that the Russians now have influence in a region where uh, the British, and especially, really the British, want to keep them from gaining influence. All right, so it got tabled. And then remember, after the war, uh, and after the Congress of Vienna, and we started to watch the Russians maneuver uh, to gain more influence in this region that we call the Balkans, to hopefully gain access to a warm water port. We talked about the Greek independence movement and how Russia had been utilizing that as a means to try to gain some kind of control and that the French and the British ended up joining the Greek independence movement really to serve as a counter, counterweight to Russia. And by Greeks, or the Greece, Greek being becoming an independent and sovereign state, that keeps the Russians from being able to turn them into a puppet regime. Okay. And then later on, there was this battle where uh, the Egyptian um, figure, his name was Mohammed Ali, or Muhammad, or Mahmed Ali, uh, who was trying to um, maybe potentially wage an invasion against the Ottoman Empire. And then the Russians stepped in and said, we will support the Ottoman Empire against any phrase that might come uh, from Egypt. And that was a way of the Russians, instead of fighting the Turks this time, befriending the Turks, so that ultimately the Turks would turn over some type of territorial sovereignty uh, to the Russians. And when the British found out about that, they said, our warships will be on your shores in a matter of days. And the Russians backed off, because they did not want that fight with Britain. Well, it was inevitable for the British and the, and the Russians to eventually clash. And they finally do uh, in the Crimea. And the way that it starts is that the, the Pope, um, or the French uh, leader at the time, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, was given the same concessions in the Holy Land that the Russians were. In other words, Napoleon would have the right to protect Orthodox, or I'm sorry, Roman Catholics in the Holy Land. And the Russians were like, wait a second, wait a second, time out. We're the ones that protect Christians. And they said, well, yeah, you protect Orthodox Christians, but the Roman Catholics, those will be protected by France. And Russia got really bent out of shape about the fact that it seemed like France was, was kind of like barking on their tree. And so in response to it, Russia did something really hasty and stupid. They occupied a couple of territories that they had protector rights over, and that was Moldavia and Wallachia. So as far as the, the British and the French saw, the Russians are making an aggressive move into the Balkans, occupying landed space that is moving them ever closer towards that warm water port. Okay? And at that point, the British look at the French, and the French look at the British, and Sardinia Piedmont's like, hey, we can join too. Uh, and they all finally said, you know, we need to teach Russia a lesson. They cannot boss their way around the Balkans, and they cannot move into the eastern Mediterranean. We got to put them in their place. And they did. And the Crimean War was fought in the middle of the 1850s. Uh, there's some famous stuff that happens there. One of them is called the Charge of the Light Brigade. Uh, Florence Nightingale in gets introduced. Uh, but make no mistake, the British are going to lay out the Russians and they will gain control over the Crimean Peninsula, at least in the interim, um, in order to sign a peace treaty that basically removes Russian naval influence from the Black Sea. And that keeps them farther and farther and farther away from their goal. Okay? That the British and the French are going to serve as a naval check that will keep the Russians contained and out of warm water ports, out of the Turkish Straits, out of the eastern Mediterranean. It's a big, big loss for Russia. But more importantly, for the Russian leadership, it was another moment where they got to see what advanced, liberal, industrialized countries look like in terms of their backward, autocratic, and really, you know, agrarian kind of societies. And that was the wake-up call that the next czar was going to utilize, okay? That the Crimean War taught them a lesson, and that lesson was, we've got to start reforming. So, we've had Alexander I, who, because of the Napoleonic Wars, said, we need to reform. Then we had that moment, that Cossack rebellion for the 19th century in the form of the Decemberist Revolt in 1825, and rather than the Russians using that as impetus for further reforms, they reacted. Lysol, 
and then set them back another 30 years. Then you had the Crimean War, which setting them back 30 years exposed them again when they started to engage with Western powers and realized how behind the times they really were, which ushers in a new period of reform, and that's under Alexander II. Okay? Alexander II is known as the Great Reformer, and you guys can figure out whether he was that great. Okay? His time period is 1855 to 1881. Okay? So here are the great reforms. The first one was called the Emancipation Edict of 1861. And the argument here is that Alexander frees the serfs. But he frees the serfs in the same way that like when uh, the Emancipation Proclamation frees the slaves, but then the South imposes black codes and a whole bunch of other things, and the former slaves end up working on the same plots of land that they once worked as slaves. Okay? Same, same situation in Russia. Okay? The Russian serfs are emancipated. They're no longer called serfs. But in compensation for the losses for the Boyer nobility, okay, there was a 49-year indemnity that was going to be paid to those Boyer nobility for the losses that they had incurred by emancipating the serfs. Pretty frickin' ridiculous. Okay? And if you look at the late 19th century, there was more peasant revolts in Russia than at any point in their history. It's like, you freed us, but you really didn't. Because the rent payments were so high because of these indemnities that they more or less had to consolidate in the same space where they had worked as serfs in order to be able to pay off their debts. Okay? So they're free, but they're not. Okay? Um, these serf communes, which was literally the name, you could call it sharecropping, or you can call it like plantation by another name, but in Russia they called them mirs, M-I-R-S. And so the serfs for 49 more years on top of their, I don't know, 500 year serfdom are going to have to do 50 more. Okay, um, so free serfs, but not really, right, and that's what's going to agitate them. They're going to be like, oh, well, you haven't gone far enough. The second thing was, rather than giving like a straight up like constitution and creating a representative assembly, they start local. Okay, so Alexander allowed the creation of what we call rural zemstvos, Z E M S T V O S. Right? And this was, I mean, equivalent to like a city council. Like they could vote to appropriate funds for a bridge or a hospital or a school or something like that. All right? It doesn't make any difference on national policy, but on local policy, they could at least feel like they're playing politics. Okay? So those were the big reforms that gave Alexander II the name the Great Reformer. And so you have to ask yourself, is that going to do it? And the answer obviously is no. Right? And that's why the revolutionary voices grow louder and louder, even though we're in a period of reform. It's logical that there'll be revolutionary voices in a period of reaction, but the revolutionary voices really don't go away. Okay? So even in this period of supposed reform, uh, you've got some very, very loud revolutionary voices that are starting to pop up uh, under Alexander II. Okay? The first comes from literature is called nihilism. Nihilism means belief in nothing, which was a term that was coined by Ivan Turgenev, who was one of the great realist writers. Chekhov, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Turgenev was another one of those figures. Okay. Um, mentioned some of the characteristics of the literary nihilists. Beatniks and hippies, sexually promiscuous, promoted women's rights, promoted utilitarianism in the arts, denounced religion, circumvented or circulated revolutionary pamphlets, and called for the slaughter of the emperor. Okay? Uh, not quite the nihilists that you would have seen from the big Lebowski. Uh, they're a little bit darker even than those folks. Okay? Herzen, remember Alexander Herzen, and I told you how he prefigures populism with some of his ideas about land reform. That actually becomes a party called the populists. All right. In uh, Russia, they're called Narodnik, which means land and freedom. But the idea was to create a social revolution based on the communal life of the peasants. This is the agricultural socialists. 
All right, you don't really have like a Marxian type of thing yet. That's what's kind of goofy. I mean, Marxism is is in full swing in Western Europe, but Russia is the farthest thing possible from a Marxist revolution because Marxism sees like industrial capitalism as the thing that needs to be overthrown by workers. All right, ninety five to ninety six percent of Russia is still rural uh, agricultural producers, farmers, peasants, all right, pseudo serfs, whatever you want to call it. So that's where they wanted society to get reorganized. Populism made a hell of a lot more sense. Okay. Bakunin's anarchists, remember Bakunin from the first half of the 19th century. The second, the, I guess the guy that kind of takes the torch is a guy named Sergei Nechev. His work was called Revolutionary Catechism. All right, But you're starting to hear um, louder voices for a more violent and a more kind of direct action oriented uh, movement in Russia. Like we need to seize control of the government. And that's what he's arguing. Okay. And so the last thing it says is that Nechev and Bakunin's angst is radicalized even further in a group called the Pop or the People's Will. Okay, these are led by a variety of people. Um, one of them is this woman named Vera Zasulich, uh, and then there's another figure named Sofia Parovskaya. And their arguments are that we are going to get to a society. Um, and I wanted to. I wanted to take a moment here to just read something really quick um, from the people's will. Can't seem to find it, but we'll figure it out. Um, if you go into miscellaneous resources, we should be able to find it in Kagan. So let me go quickly to that. Um, there's this old Kagan chapter. Um, I think that's it. I'll see. Yeah. So, this is from the people's will, um, and one of the arguments that they're making, let me see if I can get this up, um, here's what it says, it says, although we are ready to submit wholly to the popular will, we regard it as nonetheless our duty as a party to appear before the people with our program. And if you look at it, it kind of, uh, it covers the gauntlet uh, of different changes. The first says perpetual popular representation, which is literally like suffrage. They wanted the ability to be able to speak politically, uh, have power to act on all concerns that the nation would have. That's a very liberal democratic type of idea. The second was lo general local self-government secured by the election of all officers and the economic independence of the people. The third was a self-controlled village commune as an economic and administrative unit. Fourth was land ownership by the people. Fifth, that, I mean that's the social revolutionaries. Fifth, a system of measures having for their object the turning over to the laborers of all mining works and factories. That's more garden variety industrial socialism. Okay, The idea that the means of production and distribution should be controlled by everybody. Six, 
complete freedom of conscience, speech, association, public meeting, and electioneering activity. And that's, you know, liberalism, okay? Modern liberalism. And the seventh says the substitution of a territorial militia uh, for the army, okay? And that their means of trying to do that were, A, propaganda and agitation. The second one was destructive and terroristic activity. And they certainly did that. Okay, so if we go out of this set of notes here and back to the other ones, close that tab, um, we end up in a situation where at the very end of the 1870s, the voices of the popular will are getting louder, the people's will, and a woman by the name of Sofia Perovskaya uh, will be responsible for the assassination of Tsar Alexander II. Okay. Um, they wait for him to, in his caravan, and they're ultimately like riding along in the woods. And they, uh, this woman, you know, they kind of got him surrounded, and they throw a bomb. Uh, and then the bomb ends up blowing up a carriage that's ahead of Alexander and his family. So Alexander, with all of his, you know, acumen of the situation, decides to get out of his carriage and then walk up to see w what happened. And while he walks up, Sophia's kind of sitting there with a the bomb and is like, and then throws it at him and blows him up. So, bye-bye, uh, Tsar. And um, part of it was just the inability of the um, Tsarist government to adopt any kind of meaningful reforms. I don't think it matters. So the guy that tried to do the reforms, allegedly, um, is the target of assassination because those reforms... Uh, were surface reforms. They weren't really meaningful enough, and they certainly weren't meaningful enough uh, for, for the people's will. Okay? Um, and so he's dead. Now, what does Russia do? They do what they always do. They looked at it as, yet again, another Cossack rebellion that requires another period of cleansing. All right? Cleansing in their regard, as old as like the 1300s, uh, would be to react. Lysol. Here it comes. It stinks in here. Just so happens that the leader, the next czar, is the son of the czar that just got assassinated. Okay? That's why I wrote, oh my god, you killed daddy. You know, because they did. They killed daddy. And that's not cool. Alright, so they go after him. They go after the people that did it. And there's another round of what they call russification. Russification is a mean of, means of re-educating the people in what it means to be Russian, which is docile, which is respectful of autocratic government, which is um, orthodox, which is obedient, uh, the whole nine. So there's a whole round of stuff. Another minister of education, this time it's, his name is Konstantin Pobanetsev, uh, there's a new secret police leader, his name is Vyacheslav Pleve. And then they have another round of russification. And an increase in censorship, exiling, and punishing dissidents. And uh, you add a new dimension to their activities, which is to target Jews in various communities, blame them for all of the ills of Russian uh, society, uh, and then uh, target them and kill them. Which is why, you know, there's going to be more than a million Jews that are going to be leaving Russian territory in the first decade of the, uh, of the uh, 1900s. Okay? So, Alexander III, straight up reactionary. Okay? Uh, a lot of this stuff, the tough love and everything else, uh, he's not going to last long. Alright? And eventually he's going to be replaced uh, by Tsar Nicholas. And Nicholas, of course, is the last Tsar. Very, very similar to Louis the Sixteenth, kind of a clueless Winnie the Pooh type of dude. All right, he did do some good things at the very beginning. The one good thing that he did uh, was that he appointed a new finance minister that was going to rapidly modernize the country. His name was Sergei Vita, W I T T E. He was the minister of finance, and he's the one that started to industrialize Russia. All right, they built this massive. Um, Trans-Siberian Railroad, um, and then just involved in rail railroad building was going to be a whole bunch of other stuff that would require coal and iron, steel production, the mines were all over the place, 
Uh, they were going to attract investors from outside that would start financing these ventures. Uh, they went on to the gold standard. Uh, they started to expand the Pacific. They started to set up trade ports in the Pacific. Um, and they were rapidly modernizing society, which has a good element to it. That good element, of course, is that they are now industrializing. They're no longer specifically uh, like a feudal agricultural society. The bad of that, though, is remember when we talked about proximity discontent. If you industrialize, kind of by nature, you're urbanizing. And if you urbanize, that means that you're packing discontented people together in, in dense spaces. So then you can actually have uh, the kind of workers' uprisings uh, that Marx talks about. Okay? It can't just be social revolutionary or agricultural socialism or populism. Now you've actually added the element that Marx was talking about where you do have an urban overthrow of capitalism, although this is hardly capitalism. It does have industrialization. It does have urbanization. Uh, but you could hardly say that this would be communism overthrowing capitalism. It would have taken Russia a hundred years to be fully capitalist. They weren't even close, okay, on any of these other markers, okay. But you do add new elements, okay, to the revolutionary part. So we're still in a period of reaction. You could say that there's some reforms that are happening under Nicholas. The Minister of, of Finance is certainly reforming, okay, even though politically they're still in a reaction period. But the revolutionaries are going to start they're, they're going to start going again too. Just a matter of time. And usually it's going to come in exile. All right. So, the first group okay, is a group called the Social Democrats. Okay. And eventually there's going to be this meeting in London, and we're going to talk about this later. All right. But ultimately there's going to be a split among Russian people that would identify as Marxist. Okay, and it, it ends up splitting into two groups. One's called the Mensheviks, and the other's called the Bolsheviks, and that's where Lenin gets introduced. But that's a topic for a later day. Okay. Um, the second is the socialist revolutionaries, and that's literally like the the logical next step of the agricultural socialists. So Herzen is ultimately getting us to a place where we have this group called the socialist revolutionaries, and then we've got some straight up liberals. And those liberals are called Constitutional Democrats, or cadets, spelled with a K, K-A-D-E-T-S. And they're the ones that would have wanted, like, um, you know, Republican government, freedom of speech, press, assembly, etc., etc., uh, classical liberal, uh, to, to even to some extent. The protection of private property, laissez-faire economics, uh, individual liberties, that type of thing. Okay, so that's what's out there, all right? Another pants drop moment, okay, which is where Russia gets exposed for how backward they really are by interacting with another foreign power. We saw it with France under Napoleon. That led to a period of reform under Alexander I. We saw it in the Crimean War, which led to another period of reform under Alexander II. This one is a battle in the Pacific called the Russo-Japanese War. And ultimately, the Japanese hand Russia their ass. Okay? They're fighting over islands and they're fighting over influence uh, in the Pacific. And Japan, which at one time was a backward feudal state, had rapidly industrialized and modernized and built a state-of-the-art navy and then took it to Russia. Okay? And so the terms of the treaty were ultimately bad. Russia gets exposed. But then all the while, you still have peasants who are unsatisfied because of the, the 49 year indemnity. You have a whole bunch of urban workers now that are su suffering from, from bread, you know, the rising bread prices or bread shortages. Okay, so like things that you would have seen in Western Europe are now starting to happen in places like Moscow and St. Petersburg. And they're desperate to get the Russian government to do something to, to, to change the country. So there's protests. All right. And now finally, Russia has its 1848 revolution. They have theirs in 1905. Right? And it's called the Revolution of 1905. All right. So here's how it starts. Uh, there's an uprising 
And it's a peaceful demonstration outside the Winter Palace. It's led by a priest. His name was Father Gapone. All right? And of course, Nicholas freaks out, as well as the government, and they start shooting at the crowd. Now, that's stupid. All right, that's like a guarantee that there's going to be a revolution because the people are so agitated, and if that's going to be their response, they don't want to listen to us, they want to shoot us, all right, well, that's only going to make them more antagonized. So they start getting louder and more vocal, and it's not doing anything, and now uh, Nicholas is scared because he's out of, he doesn't know what to do. All right, he's like, you know, normally we just shoot people, and that doesn't seem to have had any kind of effect. Okay, that's what happens when you have proximity discontent. Very easy to beat a peasant rebellion. But when you've got masses that are concentrated and violent and, and upset and desperately want change, and then you kill some people and turn them into martyrs, and then kill a priest, for God's sakes, who was a fan of the czar, all right, that's only going to add to all of the antagonism. So the people are louder and more demonstrative for reforms, and eventually Nicholas says, okay, uh, if you want a constitution, if you want to create a representative assembly, then do it. All right, they got him. So there's this thing called the October Manifesto where the people sit down, and it's really dominated by liberals, the cadets, which is, seems like it follows the same script as everybody else's revolution. They have a bourgeois type of movement to try to create a liberal constitution, and they create a representative assembly called the Duma. So it's like Russia almost got to a 1688 revolution in 1905. All right, still czar in charge. Uh, the only difference is they've now got a constitution and they've got a liberal assembly. Okay, a Duma. But in order to make sure that the czar is not uh, held, I guess, subordinated to the Duma, he passes this thing called the Fundamental Laws, which is literally like it gives him a blanket veto um, and the capacity to disband the Duma if it does anything too crazy. All right. So, needless to say, we're going to watch a whole bunch of Dumas between 1905 and 1914. And any time they start to get too caustic, you know, and they start asking for too much, he'll just dissolve the Duma. So it really never has any effect. Okay? Here's one good thing that happens right before the Russian Re or the, the war breaks out in 1914. And that is that there's a guy by the name of Peter Stolopin, and he passes what's known as the Agrarian Reform Act. And what it did was it eventually got rid of those 49-year indemnities. Okay? So now the serfs are really not serfs and that they could become uh, landowners. All right? And the idea was, let's try to draw a wedge between the peasants and then some of these urban workers and then also the liberals. All right? Divide and conquer. You know, it's kind of, it's a cool strategy. You know, it's like taking, uh, you know, African Americans and Latinos and, and putting them on one side and then white working class people on the other and then getting them to blame each other for each other's problems. All right? Very clever. Okay. So that's what ends up happening. There's an emancipation for the peasants. The peasants are now like yay czar, and the liberals are really kind of handcuffed because every time they try to do something, their Duma resolve, or it dissolves. Okay. Remember what I said. Revolutionaries are only getting louder. Social revolutionaries are getting loud. The cadets are getting loud. And now you've got a really, really big force that's operating in London where you have two different variations of Marxism that are ready to play out. And one of them actually uh, tries to look at Russia and figure out how Marx could make sense in Russia. And that's Lenin. Okay? And all that stuff is working itself out as we get to World War I. All right? Now there's going to be a question that will be asked about all of these states. Like how the hell could everybody get so excited about going to war? Look at the domestic political conditions in Russia on the eve of the war. Look at how many discontented people there are. Look at how many people are unsatisfied with czarist government. Okay? The czar and all conservatives know that nationalism can be used as a means of pacifying domestic political voices. It's called rally around the flag. Okay? 
And so ultimately in 1914, uh, when Russia finally makes fateful decisions that they will eventually go to war with Germany, uh, everybody's excited about it. It's almost like the Tsar said, see, I knew it. We could get people on the same page. Everybody wants to be a patriot. Everybody is Russian before they're liberal or Democrat or socialist revolutionary or Menshevik or Bolshevik or pro-Tsar or anti-Tsar. But you better do well in that war. And what do you think? How the Russians going to do in that war? So that's all I got for that. Um, nobody's here, so I guess there isn't any questions. Right? Um, okay. Well, if you do get to see this and you do have questions, make sure that when you come to class on Wednesday or Thursday, uh, that you ask questions about this. And of course, the reading, like I said, there's some Vialt chapters that are associated with it. There is a Kagan chapter that is associated with it. And there's about four or five pages of McKay uh, chapter 23 that are associated with it. If you read those chapters, and if you read that stuff, uh, if there's anything that I didn't cover, uh, let me know. And, and we can certainly Q&A this stuff uh, in the time that we'll have allowed. Okay, thank you.